But I love that song. I've been playing that song throughout the day. How many of you want to have God breathe on you? Now I got to turn this part back up. Send the fire. 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 Consume. Baptize. Send your fire. 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 All right, let me let me go ahead and break it on down because um I can keep letting that play. That song will stir you up in your belly. Well, it's Tuesday, and you know it's another time for the battlefield of the mind where we are going through this book by Joyce Meyer chapter by chapter question by question this is his ministry hearts and submission where our mission is to minister to the heart mind and the soul of the woman our vision is to encourage healing deliverance restoration personal and spiritual growth through biblical study our foundational scripture is Psalms 51 and 10 creating me a clean heart O God and renew a steadfast spirit in me. So Marys, I welcome you for those that are joining us live and for those that are gonna listen on the replay. I am Sarah Houston. I have my awesome co-host evangelist Keisha on the line and we are getting into these wilderness mentalities. But before we go ahead and get the recap from last week, I am gonna open up in prayer, go through the recap from last week and then we're going to go on into chapter 20 which we're talking about don't make me wait for anything i deserve everything immediately mm -hmm. don't make me wait for anything i deserve everything immediately we're going to let that rest right there so let's put a pin in that all right all hearts and minds are clear let's go ahead and open up in prayer Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we just bless you. We give you glory. We thank you for another day, God. We thank you, Father, for health, God. We thank you that our bodies have no sickness nor disease, God. We thank you for having our right mind. We thank you for your new mercy this day, God. We thank you, Father, that you are continuing to order our steps. We thank you for hearts of repentance, God. We thank you, Father, for being able to open up our mouths and be able to bless you, to be able to call on the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. We don't take it for granted, Lord. So, Lord, I ask that you will begin to perfect everything that concerns each and every woman that hears this message, God. Lord, I ask that they will not only hear our voices, God, but that you will speak to them directly. Begin to open up their ears of understanding, Lord. Give them new revelation, Father. Lord, I pray that they will take what they hear and they will apply it in their lives, Father, that they will begin to be the change agents, to be the difference maker, God, that you alone are God. We are just your vessels, God. So, Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We come to you in humility, Lord. We say less of us and more of you, Father. Give us what needs to be spoken through your word, Father. Make it plain, make it clear. We ask, Father, that there will be no confusion. The enemy will not muzzle and contaminate and scramble our words, but it will be clear. So, Lord, we thank you. We give you all the honor. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, Marys. So, we are picking up um, with the recap of ending of chapter nine, which was, I can't help it. I'm just addicted to grumbling, fault finding and complaining. I'm telling you, these wilderness mentalities have been so true. And even though we went to different portions of the book with the conditions of the mind and understanding the state of mind, when we get into these wilderness mentalities, 
if we're honest, we all have found ourselves with these mentalities. The thing is, is that as we're talking about it, we want to become more cognizant and recognize the signs of when we're falling into these mentalities and utilizing the tools that God has given us, that is in the Bible, um, even some common sense tools to be able to help you turn from those wilderness mentalities and make a change. So I can't help it. I'm just addicted to grumbling, fault finding, and complaining. Have that been you this week, last week? Maybe, possibly, no? Okay, just bear with me one second here. Um, evangelist, um, just would you check the, what you would call it to make sure I saw somebody trying to get on. Okay, so I'm going to read Philippians 2, 14 and 15. And it says, do all things without complaining, disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So I'm gonna read that again. Do all things. He didn't say some, he didn't say a little bit, he didn't say, you know, 50%. He said, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. And so question six said, according to this passage, why are we to do all things without grumbling, fault finding and complaining? Well, one thing, no one likes to hear someone complaining, fault finding, grumbling, always got something negative to say, that's in general. but. For those of us that call ourselves children of God, we are held to even a higher standard. We are trying to be like our father, Jesus. And so we want to show ourselves blameless, guiltless, innocent, and uncontaminated as vessels of God so that we can be examples in the midst of this dark, perverse, crooked world that we're living in, this unbelieving world where now you have so much hybrid spirituality and Christianity going on that we are called to be set apart, not to blend, not to smooth things over. But if we are not setting the example, if we're not living up to the word, if we're not being that uncontaminated vessel, how do we expect to draw others to Christ? So as a child of God, as you begin recognizing that you're in this mentality, you're in this wilderness um, state of mind of complaining and fault finding and grumbling, you got to stop and do an inventory check. What is going on? Why am I doing this? What's happening? For some, it may be because you have gotten off track with your relationship with Christ. You're not really reading the word. If you're reading the word, you're just skimming through today's scripture, you're not really meditating on that word. You're not really trying to go deeper into it. You're not trying to get an understanding. It also may that your prayer life has dwindled, where you used to make time to really get up and pray and talk to God throughout the day. Maybe you only find yourself saying a quick prayer and only saying a blessing over your food. Have you changed what you're listening to? Are you listening to a lot of stuff that just pumps negativity, sadness, um, anger, all these negative, adverse emotions and, and thoughts. And are you even watching things like that, that per, you know provokes these things like Real House of Atlanta, um, real life hip hop, all this type of stuff. And you watch it and you're listening to this stuff, your mind begins to pick this stuff up unconsciously and you'll find yourself picking up what they're doing. So as children of God, we are to recognize when this stuff is happening and we begin to renew our minds. We begin to wash our minds with hyssop. What does that look like? Well, when I see myself going down that grumbling and complaining, I got to look at, again, why is this happening? Where have I buried off? Because if I'm 
praying and I'm in the word and I'm worshiping God every day, that's going to make me feel more convicted to get it right, to repent, to do a 360 change. And maybe you're not, maybe you haven't given your life to Christ, but you also find yourself in these conditions. And it's the same thing in a sense that what are you feeding yourself? Who are you around? Are you around people who are doing this thing? And then before you know it, you're picking it up as well, right? So that's why in that passage, the Bible said to show ourself blameless, guiltless, innocent, right? Uncontaminated because people are watching us. They're looking to see how we handle things. They're looking to see how God is moving in our lives. They're looking to see if we're authentic in Jesus Christ, or if this is something that we just put a show on when it's convenient. All right. So now we're going to move on to um, Philippians 4, 6. And that scripture is, just give me one second here while I grab that one. That scripture, again, is Philippians 4, 6. And I'm... Um, reading all this in the New King James Version. Okay, and it reads, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Be anxious, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known, be made known to God. So we move into 7a, and it says, what does Paul teach us in this verse? Because Apostle Paul was the one um, writing in Philippians. What teach us about this verse, about how to solve our problems? So the author talks about to not worry, to not get anxious, to not analyze, you know, every little thing to not um, just start becoming fearful, but to go to God in prayer and petition, not complaining, but giving thanks. So I can say it in two ways. When you begin to prayer and you're going to pray and you're praying to God and you're, you're making your petition known, you're saying, God, you know, I'm coming to you. I really need you to move in my life in this area of healing or finances or whatever you're going to him for. As you are making your petition known, you're not going to him saying, God, why does this keep happening to me? I can't believe this happened to me. You know, I know it has to be because of this, that as you're praying, your prayer is becoming a bunch of complaining, a bunch of fault finding, a bunch of excuses, right? And then you begin to start getting worried while you're praying and get anxiety. But what if it's not done? Well, God, are you hearing me? You know, I, I prayed about this three times. It still hasn't happened. And so you begin to get yourself worked up or you begin to get fear and these emotions are starting to pump. And then you're wondering, well, well why aren't you answering this? Why am I feeling this? Or, you know, you begin to pull back and the enemy begins to come in and try to to give you the fear, to give you the doubt. But rather when we go to God and first we go, we should go to him in the first place with thanksgiving. We should open up our prayer, giving him praise, giving him thanks for all the things that he has done, all the things that he's doing that we have yet to see and all the future things. So if we begin to shift it and not just say, here's all my petitions, here's everything I need you to do, but God, I thank you. God, I lift you up. I give you glory. I thank you for keeping me another day. I thank you for giving me surprise blessings, for putting people in my path that have helped me to manage my finances, or that was a financial blessing, or leading me to the right doctor, or whatever it is. You begin to not just go to him with the position, I mean, the um, petitions, just feeling all anxious and stuff, but you begin to give him thanks, give him glory, bring it back, put it on the altar, begin to trust him. And remember, he's going to move in his timing and his timing is always better than our timing. And so B says, when does murmuring, complain, excuse me, when does murmuring, grumbling, fault finding and complaining usually occur in our lives? When we have gone outside of God's will, 
When it did not work according to our plans, our thoughts are a timeline. So when we set out our plan with our timeline, with how we feel like it should be, and it doesn't happen, then that's where all these other things come into play. We start murmuring, grumbling, fault finding, complaining, speaking negative. You know, we'll start thinking about it and then we'll begin to voice it and then it will even begin to show in our action. So either you're asking God to help order your steps and you're acknowledging, you're asking him so that you can acknowledge him in all your ways to give you wisdom to direct your path and to do it in his will, or either you're going to do it for him. So either you're coming to him in prayer, you're saying that you want to submit to him to allow him to do it because he knows best. He knows what you want even before you even get it out. He knows what you're thinking before you even think your thought. He already knows what you're going to do. But what he's also doing is building our, our faith, building our dependency on him, having us recalibrate and look at ourselves and say, whoa, wait a minute, God, I came to you all wrong. Let me make it real clear. And I'm going to wrap up this, um, try to wrap up this real quick so we can get on to the next portion with evangelists. But if you have a parent or you have someone and <laughs> as a child or as, or even having, you know, someone coming to you and they're, they keep asking you for things and they're like, well, when are you going to do this? I thought you were going to give me this money. I thought you were going to buy me this. I thought you said you were going to do that. And then you're like, okay, I am going to do this. And I told you when, but I need it now. I want it now. I thought, I thought I would have it by now. You begin to rattle off all of your demands, your timelines, your thoughts. But when you believe that should have been done by that person that you were petitioning that for, but according to that person, they may have already had it already planned out. Well, I'm going to be able to do it in, at this time in this way. And so what you begin to see is that the person who is petitioning, you keep coming back and now you're complaining, you're nagging. Everything is negative. I thought this, I thought this. And then the enemy begins to set you up for disappointment because your expectation is not met, right? Not knowing that you hadn't really it hadn't really been maybe expressed what the timeline was going to be or how they were going to do it or if they were going to do it. And so when you have that flood of negativity come through it, then you begin to back off and start seeing it like I'm going to do it myself. And that's kind of what we do with God. We put all this expectation on him and everything and we come at him and throw everything at him, but we don't want to step back and allow him to do it. And we also don't want to come and give thanks and gratitude for already what has been done, right? So even with the natural um, example, he's like, you know, Keisha, I thank you for everything that you have done. You have always been there. I always can trust and depend that you're going to get it done. I'm so thankful instead of, well, Keisha, I need you to do this and blah, 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 blah. And you know the timeline and no, I'm thankful because you're doing it. I'm thankful because I can even come to you as a resource or whatever it is. I'm thankful. Okay. So moving on to see what does the word of God teach us to do during these times? God's word teaches us to be patient. He is going to help us grow in those areas that we need to be strengthening. Patience. He's going to teach us in trusting him, in being obedient, in relying on him, in seeking his face. D says, patient is not the ability to wait, but the ability to keep a good attitude while we are waiting. Hmm. Sometimes that can really push us. While we're waiting on something, we can be so impatient. We can get frustrated. We can get nervous. We can get fearful. We can get disheartened. But if we can just reevaluate and step back and look at it from another perspective and learn to keep a good attitude about it and maybe even say it's well, you know, it don't look good, but it's going to be well. I'm going to get through this. There's expiration at the end of this date. They're going to have to get back to me. There is going to be a decision made. You have to 
try to be intentional about stepping back and looking at that thing and said, I'm still gonna have a good attitude out of this. And as you have a good attitude out of that in that situation, remember other people are looking and they're watching. They may not say anything, but they're watching, they're looking. And if you're professing to be a child of God, a follower of Jesus Christ, they're really watching you to see how you're handling the storms, the trials that come through your life, because they are looking for an answer too. And we know that Jesus is the remedy. So you may be the only living Bible or the example that they're seeing. So we got to be cognizant of that. E says, how can you overcome complaining? By not giving power to your negative thoughts, your negative words, not allowing them to become negative actions. By redirecting it to the word of God, find you a scripture, find you a worship song, something that's going to encourage, that's going to uplift your spirit. Begin talking to God. It ain't got to be this big formal, you know, Lord's prayer, but you begin to open up that dialogue back with Jesus and have that conversation with him. Search your heart, take inventory for areas that you might need to repent in because you've been complaining, you've been fault finding, you've been making excuses repent okay you don't want to continue on that way you probably will even get tired of your own self if you don't begin to check that and the enemy likes to come in through those little gates and wreak havoc not only in your life but in the relationships that you have around you will also be affected by this type of wilderness mentality all right so once you you repent and you begin to stop confessing the negative, but start thinking and being thankful for your blessings and know that even though it doesn't look good, even though it might not have turned out the way you have wanted it, may not have even have met your timeline, there is an expiration to it. And trust God, because even through all of this, there is a lesson. And this is how you begin to grow, not only as an individual in the natural, but how you begin to grow spiritually. So with that, I'm going to come to an end because I don't want to take any more time with this, but I'm going to open it up. I don't know if Evangelist or anyone else had anything that they wanted to um, comment on or if they wanted to ask a question. And if not, uh, we'll move on to the next portion. Amen, amen. A uh, great evening, Marys. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Great evening, Marys. Looks like someone cannot hear me. Let's see. Let me try to increase my volume just a little bit. But for those of you who actually can hear me, just, you know, making sure that we we are. We got you. You got me. Good, good, good. Just making sure as we uh, come to the close of this chapter uh, 19 on I Can't Help It, I'm just addicted to grumbling, fault finding, and complaining that wilderness mentality number four. And moving into that chapter number 20, don't make me wait for anything. I deserve everything immediately. And that's that wilderness mentality number five. And of course, Mary, you know that, you know, those of you who've been with us for a while, that these chapters build on each other. And the basic concept of the wilderness mentality is a wrong mindset. And I deem it safe to say it's a mind without the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. It is a contaminated mind, as Minister Sarah was um, just recapping in that question number uh, six and seven, uh, clearly, If we have these type of strongholds and mind-binding spirits that jump out at us as we, you know, come to the close of that, uh, the conclusion 
<clears throat> of this chapter number 19 after the recap that all of these things are mind-binding spirits. They are products of a wrong mindset, which is the wilderness mentality. That is, in its essence, it's the wilderness mentality. And it causes you to stop and think. And it causes you to assess yourself and think about where you are. And, you know, there's so much that I always get out of it. And there's a lot, Mary's. Go back and listen to last week because Minister Sarah spoke to so much in these last questions, uh, number six and seven. But the marker for me, I think, as a whole is a major marker is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the spirit, you know, because the fruit of the spirit is and the byproducts of the fruit helps to recalibrate our minds and gives us the ability to have a second thought as well. Our, our helmet of salvation is called dependent on that fruit so that our, our minds can be engaged, which is our helmet of salvation, okay, our armor can be engaged because if it's just dormant, then that leaves it vulnerable to other things that are not of God. Strange fruit, and not the fruit of the spirit, but strange fruit would be, would be considered something that will cause us to grumble, complain, fall fine, and not be patient, okay? And we're moving into that chapter number 20, this, this is just taking us right into that because all of those demon groupings and mind-binding spirits shake hands. So I would say, um, Minister Sarah, what I got out of that, you know, like I said, the, the marker is the, having the mind of Christ, the fruit of the spirit being active and engaged. It can't be dormant, you know, um, <clears throat> patience. Patience is major. And God's timeline is not our timeline. God's timeline is not our timeline. And if we know his timeline, how do we know his timeline? No man knows the mind of Christ, except you have the mind of Christ. Except you have his mind. Then you can be led and you can be, you know, you can have strategy, you can be led, you can have, uh, you know, the patience that you need to endure and wait for it and trust that it's coming because if you have the mind of Christ, you have Holy Spirit. So that's what I got from that minister, Sarah, that segues us into this chapter number 20. Don't make me wait for anything. I deserve everything immediately. And that's that wilderness mentality number five. So Mary's Turn with us, if you're not already there in your book, to page 72 in the Battlefield of the Mind Study Guide um, by Arthur Joyce Meyer. And we're, we're going to cover questions one and two. Let's see, one, two, and three tonight. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to get through those questions. But if you don't have your, your book, it's okay. Make sure you have the word of God because the word of God is the prerequisite. And that's where we glean and, and get all of our answers as we, as Mary sit at the feet of Jesus. So let's move on <clears throat> to that. Question number one and the scripture reading there. So I'm going to read the scripture first and then I'll go to the, the questions in that. It's A, B, and C are the questions those are the parts. And it's James 5 and 7. So this gives you an opportunity, Marys, to hear that word and what it's saying as we read those questions. And if you've already been doing your devotional on it, then hopefully you will want to share what the Holy Spirit has downloaded to you this week or whatever he brings to you even at, in the midst of the Bible study. Okay? And so that James... Five and seven reads, and it's the Amplified Version, and it speaks to exhortation. And it says, So wait patiently, brothers and sisters, until the coming of the Lord. The former waits expectantly 
for the precious harvest from the land, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. So therefore there are seasons and there's a process of waiting. And it's how we behave in the waiting. Our attitude and our mindset about the waiting. And you will hear us continue to speak to the mind of Christ. You will continue to hear us speak to the fruit of the Spirit. You will continue to hear us speak to the Holy Spirit. Because with, without the fruit of the Spirit, without Holy Spirit, who is the, the product, that fruit of the Spirit is, are the byproducts of Holy Spirit. And the mind of Christ is a part of the Trinity. Because without them, then we don't have the capacity nor the bandwidth to wait. And even look at this James 5 and 7 as exhortation. We don't have the ability to look at it as a good thing. But when you have the heart and the mind of Christ, then you know that the beauty in continuing to serve and continue to sow good seed and continue to press will produce that harvest. So the exhortation is, is to be expected, expecting God to act, expecting for him to do exactly what he said he's going to do and that he will not delay. He won't. Because everything he does is within its season and its timing and it will not yield the fruit that we're expecting beforehand. Neither will it be late. It, there won't be a delay. So this, this scripture said, for the precious harvest from the land, being patient, waiting for it expectantly, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. Now let's look at these questions related to this scripture. Okay, part A says, Impatience is the fruit of what? Impatience is the fruit of what? Pride. You heard me say strange fruit. Clearly, the clear demarcation between what is the fruit of the spirit, that that is good, that is lovely, that is kind, that represents the Trinity, that represents our, our Father God that represents Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that represents Holy Spirit God, is just the opposite. And anything that is not like him would be strange fruit, would be uh, that that is the acts of the flesh that's <clears throat> yielded from the acts of the flesh. So impatience is a fruit of pride. And what happens with pride, Mary's pride goes before a foul, before destruction. And there's scripture reference for that. And that's that Proverbs 16 and 18. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Now, this is not in the book. But as we go through it, the Holy Spirit gives us additional cross references of his word to help bring his, to make his point. And what he's saying to us so he can break it down to us so that we can wrap our minds around it. And, and here's the deal. If we don't have the mind of Christ, there's no mind that's engaged and active to even wrap around anything except that that would be of the flesh. That that would be of the enemy. That, that would be of the, the central dark nature. And in that central dark nature lies impatience, lies pride lies ego and ego is what edging God out okay so the opposite of that then so if impatience is the fruit of pride and pride goes before a fall and that Proverbs 16 and 18 says just what it says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a foul okay so if that's what pride looks like and in that strange fruit it's not the fruit of the spirit. So then what does the fruit look like, the fruit of the spirit that would replace that pride? That would be patience and long suffering. 
that would be patience and long suffering. And that's what he desires of us. Okay, so that we can prosper and that our souls will prosper and we will be in good health in every area of our lives. And that we wouldn't be rushed, we wouldn't be pressed because we know we can wait on the Lord with expectancy. And when I say wait, I'm not saying waiting as you're sitting and twiddling your thumbs in idleness, but waiting on him as in as a servant doing what it is that he has called you to do in the earth while you are waiting for the Lord's return. That means that you're actively engaged and doing what he's asked. You're not sitting back watching the clock. With a wilderness mentality, number five, don't make me wait for anything. I deserve everything immediately expecting for God to act in your timing when his timeline is not our timeline. However, he's never late. He's always on time. Okay. And then B says, why should we learn to be patient while waiting? Well, Marys, in that scripture again, is because when we have the mind of Christ, when we have Holy Spirit, then we have the ability to wait on him. But why? Because waiting is a part of life. It's a part of this journey. It's a part of, of who we are in this earth. We're, we're in this world, but we're not of it. And on our mission and on our journey as a part of this life, and what we've been called to do with the life that he has given us on this earth, waiting is a part of it. And that's the, the author's theory, and I agree with that. That's a school of thought. We actually spend, and she said this, she said, we actually spend more time in our lives waiting than we do receiving. We spend more time in our lives waiting than we do receiving. Okay? And then C says, what lesson do we need to learn about our life's journey? What lesson? And she said this. She said to enjoy where we are while we are on our way to where we're going. To enjoy it. To enjoy it. And how can we do that? Again, I'm going to have to take us right on back to the fruit of the Spirit. And then also I have uh, the scriptural reference here that I want to read from 2 Peter 3 and 9 that, will, that should cause us to exhale and be patient and say, okay, God, show me. And why can I do it? Because I have the mind of Christ, because then I have the, the gift of grace to be able to do it. Okay, so let's see what uh, 2 Peter 3 and 9 says about that. And I'm reading Mary's from the Amplified Version. And it says, the Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act and is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance. And here's the deal. If he were to be impatient and he were to act in the way that the enemy does cause you to be, to be irrational, to act out in doubt of fault finding, blame shifting, complaining, unforgiveness, uh, ego, and pride, if we were to act out in those ways, and if that's how, if that was the mind of Christ, and God didn't do exactly what he said here in, in uh, 2 Peter 3 and 9, a lot of us would miss it, Marys. We would miss it. But because he is showing us and giving us an example on how to wait, and in our waiting, there's even forgiveness. In our waiting, there's even compassion. In our waiting, there's even love. In our waiting, there's long suffering. So when others are not coming up to speed or we feel like, Father, I've arrived, then we think about why he's waiting. 
And why it's taking him what we would consider a, a lot of time to come back or to even act and do the things that we desire. When we start to really understand the mind of Christ that we have, because we can't understand him without it, without his mind, without the mind of Christ, then we start to, to understand that he waited for me. If he had have acted sooner, or if he had have done something different, even some things that we ask him for and we say, don't make me wait for it because I want it. My flesh is inflamed. That's where those, that byproduct of the, the uh, strange fruit and not the fruit of the spirit comes in. And that Galatians 5, 19 through 21, that's where uh, with, with that type of mindset, we can't even stop and have a second thought. But we should desire to have that same uh, mindset and, and, and operate and keep in step with the Holy Spirit and keep in step with the Lord as in that Second Peter 3 and 9 that says, the Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act. He doesn't delay as, as, as if he were unable to act, but he is not irrational. He's not erratic. And he is very methodical. He's, he's had it all figured out. It's all on a timeline. We may not know the timeline, but he says for us to do what? To wait, Mary's, as in that first passage of scripture in that James 5 and 7, but wait expectantly. Because in that uh, Second Peter 3 and 9, where he says the, the Lord does not delay as though we are as, they, as though he were unable to act and is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient towards you, towards us, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And really, that's the overarching purpose right there. That is the overarching purpose for our waiting is that none would perish those that belong to him because there are some that don't belong to him so we're not talking about them and we're not even talking about the world what we've been called to the world to do is reconciliation of souls to the kingdom to give them the word and whatever platform that looks like that is for us and carry that message but it is uh, the spirit of the Lord, that it, it is God that actually gives the increase because one plants, one waters, and it's only God that gives the increase. So we don't worry about the world. To, so we're not saying um, he's even waiting for the world because he knows who belongs to him. But he's waiting for us to get it right, Mary's. He's waiting for us to get it right. And you may say, well, then if I, I repent and I, I rededicate my life and, you know, and I feel like I'm checking out all the boxes. Some of these things, we know we've had to assess ourselves and say, okay, Father, help deliver me from this and deliver me from that. Even when we receive Jesus Christ into our heart as our Lord and Savior, there are still areas of our character that's demonized where, uh, blame shifting, fault finding, unforgiveness, grumbling and complaining. And that's just to name a few of the mind binding demonic uh, spirits and strongholds that keep us in a place where he's still saying, I need my own to get it right. I wanna make sure that they are delivered and set free. and not acting and behaving and looking like the world, those that hate him. But for those of us that say, Lord, we love you and I wanna be free. I have Holy Spirit in my heart, but there are still areas of my character that, that have been demonized and still need to be dealt with. Still need to be dealt with. And that can look like so many things. It, it don't have to just look like that uh, blame shifting, fault finding, and complaining and impatience. 
and pride, ego edging God out, but it can look like and take the form of anger, fear, abandonment, shame, lying, uh, any type of addictions that was in that chapter 19, uh, you know, making excuses, sensuality, that the flesh being inflamed, depression, grief, mental instability, procrastination, and etc. And every other little nasty functioning spirit or tentacle that shake hands and they form these demon groupings like demon gangs to attack our minds and to keep us in a place you know, looking bipolar. So I thank God that he's waiting for us. I thank him that his timeline is not our timeline. And in that we are to just exhale and breathe and say, okay, Lord, I thank you. Teach me, show me how to win. Holy Spirit is our helper. Okay. He's our counselor. He'll show us how to do it. Okay. All right. So what lesson do we need to learn? And we talked about that. What lesson do we need to learn about our, our life's journey? We just talked about that. To enjoy where we are while we are on our way to where we're going. So to breathe and exhale. And know that God is not delaying, but he has a timeline and we're just to wait on it. We're just to wait on it. There's really no other way to say it. Okay. And then question number two, and it has uh, part A and B. And the scriptural reference there is Romans 12 and 3. And I'm going to read that, Mary, so you can, can ponder on that. And then I will read the actual questions on that. Okay. So that Romans 12 and 3, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version. This is for question number two. For by grace of for by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think more highly of himself and of his importance and ability than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment as god has apportioned to each a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service so again in that mary's when you look at it in the big scheme of things God has a portion to each of us, a degree of faith and a purpose. Look at that. That's that Jeremiah 29 and 11. A purpose designed for service that he's a portion to each one of us. And that's also the grace of God, the gift of grace to be able to carry out what he's called us in this earth to do. And in our, and if we are in the first portion of that scripture, thinking more highly of ourselves and of our own importance, again, that's bearing that strange fruit because then that looks like self-righteousness. Again, that takes us back to pride, which is not of God. It's not of him. And we won't have the ability to stop and think. We won't be able to uh, have a second thought. We won't be able to seek the face of God in his mind. And it won't then be about him, but it'll be about us and what he can do for us and why it's taking him so long to do what it is that we desire for him to do for us versus us stopping and waiting and saying, Father, thank you that you have a portion to each of us, a degree of faith and a purpose designed for service. That's what you've done. And that's what you mean by that. And the reality is, Mary's, there is no softer, easier way. We have to make a decision who we're serving. And is it about us or is it about him? Because if it's about us, then that's the flesh. 
And that's on the side of the enemy. That's on the side of, of Satan. But if it's about kingdom purpose, kingdom advancement, and service to his kingdom, then everything that he's asking us to do and everything that he will ask us to do, we're able to endure it. We're able to wait. We're able to carry it out with the grace of God. And we come to the end of ourselves and we surrender and say, Father, your way, your will, not mine. And everything that is in me that is not like you, I want it out so that I won't have these bipolar moments, so that I won't maintain these wilderness mentalities, these wrong mindsets and wrong way of thinking. I want the mind of Christ. But if we're going to have the mind of Christ, we have to have Holy Spirit. And the reality is, is that when we receive Jesus, go back to that. When we receive him as our Lord and Savior, then we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We see the, receive the person of Holy Spirit. However, here's the deal. He comes into our heart and he takes up residency within us. We still may have areas of our character that were not delivered upon his entrance. Upon the reception of receiving him, we may still have things that need to be dealt with because of born in, born, being born into sin and inheriting that sin nature from our ancestral line, from that lineage, all the way back to the garden, all the way back there, and inheriting that sin nature. So there are hurts, habits, and hangups that we need to be delivered from, even though we've surrendered and said, Holy Spirit, come into my heart. So then we find, us, find it uh, difficult or it's a struggle to be able to wait and to even being asked to wait and not have a tantrum. Because when I saw that, that title, I looked at that and I looked at a child falling out and having a tantrum. And sometimes we can behave that way on God. Wilding out because things are not turning out the way we think they should or should have or whatever the deal is or feeling like we've been dealt a hand that was unfair. And God, now that I've given my life to you, I expect A, B, C, D, and E to change. And I expect for it to change immediately. The moment that I received you, I expected for that thing to come in place to get itself together that I will no longer have to deal with this. And I expect for the promises, everything that you promised me in your word for it to start manifesting right now. We don't want due process. We don't want long suffering, but the reality is, is that if we want God and we have the mind of Christ and we desire for Holy Spirit that we have received into our hearts to take a full control over our lives, Long suffering is a part of it. So that's the contrast to impatience, that long suffering. Patience is the contrast, contrast to impatience and pride and haughtiness and self-pity and self-righteousness and self-conceit. Being self-deserving. I deserve because whatever our reasons would be. Marys. Okay. So the author with that in this particular question that says, because we, we went into the scripture and we went into what that looked like. So now what did the question say? It says, why does pride prevent waiting. Well, the author said, a proud person thinks so highly of himself that he believes he should never be inconvenienced in any way. That's it. That's, that's really what we got 
out of the scripture. That is exactly what the Lord is telling us that he does not want us to do. Because when we're doing that, we're yielding strange fruit and it is not the fruit of the spirit. Because what just said it, the fruit of the spirit then in that area would be long suffering. That would be patience. That would be self-control. Look at that. The inability to wait and feel like we deserve it now, right now, that would then be a lack of self-control. And a lot of times people say, well, I don't have, you know, the ability to do that. I, I can only do it with the grace of God. Absolutely. Ding, 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 ding. Correct. We can't do it alone. We can't. And we're not being asked to do it alone. But we're being, but what we're being asked to do is surrender. Surrender to the Lord. Surrender and allow Holy Spirit to come in and take a residency in those places where those mind-binding spirits dwelled. Even after we received him, we still had a prideful and egotistical attitude because we accepted him into our heart secured our fire insurance but we can't even take up our marching orders and move forward because we still got other stuff that need to be dealt with and the way he's going to do that in us to work those things out of us is when we first surrender recognize that it's there admit it then quit it and then how do we quit it once we admit it and then we say leave me leave me in that area by exercising patience. You're dismissing and dis dismantling demonic strongholds and mind-binding spirits of pride and haughtiness and the likes, ego edging God out and the likes when we say, I'm gonna wait, I'm going to wait. And I'm going to exercise patience, which is a fruit of the spirit. I'm going to exercise self-control, which is a fruit of the spirit. I'm going to exercise long suffering. I'm going to exercise it. I'm not just going to sit there and say, Lord, deliver me from impatience. Deliver me. Yes. But then what am I going to do? The correlating action is to begin to walk out that fruit. That's why the word says that, are you walking in step with the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in tandem with him? He dwells within you, right? And that's what that scripture says. And we're going to get to that because I have passages of scripture for that, to back that up. Okay. So why does pride prevent, prevent waiting? We just said it. A proud person thinks so highly of himself that he believes he should never be inconvenienced in any way and then b says a humble person will not display what an impatient attitude that was the the art the school of thought on that and i agree with it again what does that look like that looks like the flesh inflamed that looks like strange fruit. Impatient and impatient attitude, a wilderness mentality, a wrong mindset, one that is void of and absent of the mind of Christ. It's absent of the mind of Christ. Didn't say, see, this is what we got to look at this thing. Didn't say we didn't have Jesus Christ and that we hadn't accepted him and we don't have Holy Spirit in our hearts. But we do have free will. We have free will. So if areas of our character and our minds are demonized, then that nasty spirit of impatience can strut itself in high gleam. It can be inflamed. But we need to circumcise that area in our hearts and then begin to do the opposite. And that is to speak to our mind and tell it, listen, we're going to wait. We're going to wait patiently for the Lord. And we're going to have a positive attitude while we do, while we're doing it. What? Fruit of the Spirit. We're going to uh, be, be meek. 
We're going to be humble. We're going to uh, be joyful. And we're going to have love in our hearts towards every individual involved in everything concerning it and surrounding it. And we're going to count it all joy. We're going to be at peace in the midst of it and while we wait. And while we're waiting, remember, that's not just sitting back idle, but we're doing what it is that we've been called to do in the earth for the Lord, whatever we can put our hands to, to do for him. And if in that season, you might say, okay, I don't have a particular platform. I don't have a particular outlet. And right now, I'm just sitting literally waiting. Then you open up your word and begin to read it and study it and spend that time in relationship with the Lord, with Holy Spirit so that we understand him better and we understand how to mimic him and how to walk like him and talk like him and keep in, in, in you know, uh, walk in tandem with him and keep in step with him so that he can teach us all things so that when the test come and when the trials come and when the tribulation come, we're able to endure it. And we're able to activate the grace that is in our lives. That we have not pushed out everything that is, that is like God, except Holy Spirit, because we still are his children. But because our flesh is so inflamed, we can't even hear him when he's speaking to us. And we don't want to, because we don't want to wait. Don't make me wait for anything. I deserve everything immediately. Full stop. I'm not waiting. No, yes, I'm going to wait. Plus, you're going to wait. <laughs> I'm going to buffet you, and you're going to wait so that I can stay in alignment with the word and the will of God. Why? Because I have the ability to have a second thought. I have the mind of Christ, and my helmet of salvation is active and engaged and attentive to him. And everything that is not like him recognizes it. And I say, no, Satan, access denied. I'm going to wait. All right. So, Marys, let's move on to that number three. But look, Mary, I really felt that. I'm telling you, that was something. That's something. Because even as we are studying this, this, this uh, study guide, Battlefield of the Mind, and those of you who have been uh, tracking with us all this time, you know that your life is tried by these very things. And if you say tonight that so far it hasn't been, well, it will be. It will be. And what does that look like? It means you'll be able to recognize it. And that's good. That's good. You'll be able to recognize it. That means that you do, you're not reprobate. And Holy Spirit still has that place within your heart. Now you begin to listen to him and allow him to take control of everything within you. You yield all your members to him, not just your heart. Because your heart can inhabit him, but your flesh be doing all kind of crazy. And it definitely don't want to wait. It doesn't. And if it doesn't want to wait, it's probably not waiting for the right thing. Anyway, not of God. Well, Marys, I'm going to leave that right there. Okay. Now, let's look. Uh, a question number three, and that is John 16 and 33, and that has a part A and a B to it. And let me read that scripture first. And it reads, and this is the Amplified Version, and it says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. And this is good. He's talking to us, Mary's. In the world, you will have tribulation and distress and suffering. But be courageous. Be confident. 
Be undaunted. Be filled with joy. Look, that's speaking to all of the byproducts of the fruit of the spirit and what they look like of the synonyms for what joy looks like. Joy in the Lord and being confident in him that he's going to do it. At peace because you know that God is in control. Courageous and strong, confident and filled with joy. It says, I have overcome the world. My conquest is accomplished. My victory abiding. My conquest is accomplished and my victory is abiding. That's good. Okay, so what does the question say for that, Mary? It Mary's it says here in question number three. A. If we get the idea in our heads that everything concerning us and our circumstances and relationships should always be perfect, what are we setting ourselves up for? Well, a fall. We're setting ourselves up for a fall. Remember, go back to that Proverbs 16 and 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Okay? So we're setting ourselves up for a foul. Okay? And then the other part of that says, how can this be stated another way? And the author said in that, Satan is setting us up for a foul through wrong thinking. Satan is setting us up for a foul through wrong thinking through wilderness mentality, through a, 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 a wrong mindset, where we've granted them access because of inflamed flesh, because of self-righteousness, self-conceit, self being self-willed and self-driven and all about ourself and not having the mind of Christ, ego, edging God out of it, okay? And we continue to say this. It's so important that we have the mind of Christ. What? Right thinking. Because wrong thinking is what? Just the opposite. And here's the deal, Mary. Mary's when we're assessing this and where we are, let's think about just the opposite. What is it that looks like the world, which would be considered strange fruit? And what looks like God, the mind of Christ, that would be right thinking. So if it's wrong thinking in the world, and that looks like selfishness, that looks like ego, that looks like pride, then what does it look like in the spirit, of, in the spirit realm of God, Holy Spirit, in the fruit of, byproducts of the fruit of the spirit? Right thinking right thinking okay now let me just read first corinthians 2 and 16 just to kind of look at that a little bit okay now this is not in our book but this is additional scripture that holy spirit just just showed me as i was studying and that 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, Amplified Version, it says, For who has known, we've been talking about it. I'm just reading the scripture for it now. For who has known the mind and purpose of the Lord? So as to instruct him. But we have the mind of Christ to be guided by his thoughts and his purposes. And that's what it is. So if we're going to have right thinking, Mary's, then we have the mind of Christ. We keep saying it. And if we have the mind of Christ, because there's no way we can know his mind without having his mind, right? Can't figure it out without having his mind. We need it. And that's who Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, Holy Spirit God, to guide us 
into all of his purposes and to lead us and to give us structure, to give us strategy, to give us strength and direction. Okay? All right. Now, B says, all the mishaps in the world cannot harm us if we will what? All the mishaps in the world, all the mishaps in the world, everything that could ever possibly happen in this world as a result of whatever our current situations are. And that could look like where we are right now on March, 24th, 2020, with what's happening in the world with the coronavirus. That could look like there are mishaps coming out of that, that situation. And when we have the mind of Christ Mary's in a situation like this, because see, no matter where you are, and I see that hand, and we're going to give you an opportunity to ask some questions too. No matter where you are and what situation you're being faced with, if you have the mind of Christ, you will be guided by his thoughts and his purposes. You will be given direction. You will be given a heads up. And you'll know how to navigate and you'll still maintain your peace in the midst of it. That question said, all the mishaps in the world cannot harm us if we will what, Mary's, remain in the love of God, displaying the fruit of the Spirit. Remain in the love of God. If we remain in the love of God to display the fruit of the Spirit, then Holy Spirit must dwell within us. And if Holy Spirit is dwelling within us, that means he's taking up residency within us, okay? And let me just read that fruit of the spirit because we keep going back to that, keeps making mention of that because that's what it is. We can't do this any other way without the mind of Christ and the mind of Christ being Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us in those byproducts of his spirit and the grace of God to carry them out. Even in situations that we are faced with today. And please make a note of uh, Mary, what you want to say, because we definitely want you to share. Let me just get through this and then we're going to open it up because I we definitely want to hear what the Lord is speaking to you. Now listen, okay? So this B said that we need to remain in the love of God, displaying the fruit of the Spirit. And for some of us that just may not quite know all of what that fruit of the Spirit looks like, let's just, let's just bring that to light in the Word. And it says here in Galatians, and, and here's what I, I, I gleaned from it. I went to Galatians 5, 22 through 25 because I think it's important just to hear all of this. So bearing this question in mind in that part B, in number three, that part B, all mishaps in the world cannot harm us if we will remain in Christ Jesus, remain in his love, remain within his shelter, have the fruit of the spirit displayed in our life without the mind of Christ. Galatians 5, 22 through 25 Amplified Version says, but the fruit of the spirit, the result of his presence within us is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, which is an inner peace, patience, not the ability, and it's not in our ability to wait on him, but how we act while waiting, our attitude, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay, and as well, another version says long suffering. Okay, against such things, there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, here's another prerequisite. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature, 
together with its passions and appetites, which will give us the ability to wait for him, will give us the uh, ability to have a second thought, the ability to endure and to be led by him, and that he'll be able to show us and give us direction in times like this. When we are dealing with a global pandemic and our flesh start to act up when we are hard pressed or when we are idle or when so many things are happening that we don't understand, but we can maintain our stands. We can maintain our peace. We can maintain our joy. We can maintain our self-control, long-suffering, humility, our gentleness, meekness, which those fruits of that fruit of the spirit there have those synonyms with it. We can maintain all of that in him if we have Christ Jesus and we hide ourselves in him and in his love. And it says those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature, that sinful dark nature, together with its passions and appetites. And 25 says, if we claim, and here's the thing, what we again assess ourselves, assess what we are, if we claim to live by Holy Spirit, we must also walk by the Spirit with personal integrity, godly character, and moral courage, our conduct empowered by the Holy Spirit, okay? And there's, there's one more thing I want to just share with you. There was a commentary that I read uh, by a Dunn Stewart, and it, it spoke to when does a person receive the Holy Spirit? And we keep talking about Holy Spirit because it's so important that in this season and in all of our lives as a child of God, okay, first of all, but let's talk about in this moment. But in our relationship with the Lord, if we do not have Holy Spirit and we don't understand what that looks like, then we will get caught up, we'll get deceived, we will be acting out in our flesh, bipolar behavior. We have the Lord Jesus in our heart because we secured our fire insurance and received him, but our, our sinful dark nature is acting up. So then we have to ask ourselves, is he truly dwelling within us, in our members? He's in my heart because I received him, but my flesh is inflamed. And I'm erratic. I'm imp impatient. I'm scared. I'm fearful. I'm irrational. And everything that's taking place now, every mishap, along with that that's taking place in the world right now with this global pandemic, got me on edge. And I want it to end, and I want everything to be all right, and I want it to happen right now. God, I belong to you. I surrender to you. So make it all right and make it immediate. But when we, that is not the mind of Christ. But when we have his mind and we have Holy Spirit, we have the ability to wait on it and trust him and remain in his love. So let me read that commentary so we can get to the questions. Okay, so that commentary by Don Stewart, it said, when does a person receive Holy Spirit into his life? Well, the New Testament teaches us that the reception of Holy Spirit takes place immediately upon believing in Christ as Savior. There's no need to wait in this case or plead for Holy Spirit because once you receive him, there's the simultaneous. You receive Holy Spirit because you're receiving Jesus. You're receiving God the Father because they're one, okay? So it says, there's no need to wait or plead for Holy Spirit in that case. All those who believe in Jesus instantaneously receive Holy Spirit. The scripture makes this clear. Where does the scripture make this clear? The Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians. And it says, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And when you receive Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior, it is by faith that you receive him. It's by your faith. That's also what? A fruit of the spirit. 
a fruit of the spirit. So it is by faith that you receive him. Galatians 3 and 2. And because you are sons, sons and daughters, and when he's making mention to sons, he's making mention to us as well as daughters because there's no gender in that. God has sent forth the spirit of his son, that's Jesus Christ, into your hearts. And who is his spirit? That's Holy Spirit, Galatians 4 and 6. So that's telling you how we receive the spirit of the Lord, okay? Once we receive Jesus Christ. And it says, the Bible says that a person could not be a believer without Holy Spirit, okay? Mary, so we know that, right? From as, as believers, we know. And for those of you that are listening to this Bible study that don't know, you can't. You can't be a believer without Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not speaking of making reference to with the evidence of speaking in tongues, okay? What I'm making reference to is receiving Jesus Christ into your heart and allowing Holy Spirit to come in and take up residency within you. You receive Holy Spirit just as you receive Jesus and you receive Father God. You receive the Trinity, okay? But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And that's Romans 8 and 9. And those that don't belong to him, then you would be able to see what's manifesting. It would be the dark, sensual, dark nature. Okay? And they gave scriptural reference in Jude 19. It says, these are sensual persons. These are people that act out in their flesh, flesh and flame. Galatians 5, 19. Read that and you will see what that sensual dark nature looks like. It said, these are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. That means you don't have wisdom. And you just act irrationally, which causes derision, division that causes mayhem and destruction. Okay? Self-willed. And it said, furthermore, all Christians, no matter what their spiritual condition, and listen to this. This is why we do Bible studies like this. This is why as uh, his ministry, we have been called uh, to women to encourage healing, deliverance, restoration, and spiritual growth through biblical studies and our study of the word of God. We're called to minister to the heart, to the mind, and the soul of the, of the woman. Why can we do that for believers? Why? It says here, because furthermore, all Christians, all Christians, hear this key word, no matter what their spiritual condition are said to have Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and he said this, do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you, 1 Corinthians 3.16. So he's reminding them that once they received Jesus into their hearts as their Lord and Savior, and they became Christians. They had to be reminded that the Spirit of the Lord is dwelling within you, so then you got to put off that old dark nature, even though you have Holy Spirit. But there's not a lot he can do in you if your flesh is in blank. And you're acting out of your flesh and your own will and your own self-righteousness, okay? So this explains why we still need deliverance in areas of our character and areas of our character can be demonized. We have free will to follow Holy Spirit's lead even though we've accepted him. We have free will to follow Holy Spirit even though we've accepted him. Okay, so the church at Corinth had many spiritual problems, yet the Apostle Paul said to every believer, those walking in the Spirit and those who were not had received Holy Spirit. In addition, there is no command to seek for the Holy Spirit or to pray so he can be received. 
if the Holy Spirit were given apart from salvation, we would expect the Bible to give requirements of his reception. And what do I mean by that? And what do, do he mean by that? This is what I understood from, from this commentary, is that once we receive him, then we have the gift of Holy Spirit, as well as we have the gift of reconciliation, as well as we have the gift of grace. And all of that's encompassed in him because that's the Trinity. That's not speaking to, uh, you know, uh, the evidence of speaking in tongues. That's, you know, all of that's encompassed in that. But to have Holy Spirit, if you're not speaking with the, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that doesn't mean that you don't have the Holy Spirit in your heart and that you didn't receive him. But there may be other blockages within you, within your mind, that's keeping you mind-binding spirits, that's keeping you from being fully uh, engaged and being led by the Spirit of the Lord the way you should be because of a demonized uh, character in, in whatever area that may be, okay? And we're definitely speaking to mind-binding spirits. So I am going to um, stop there, Mary's. And I see that hand. Go ahead, Mary Michelle. Go ahead. Um, I didn't necessarily have a question. I just kind of wanted to comment. Um, I'm so happy that I um I tuned in today. Um, because like you said, um, our minds can easily get distracted. Um, being that right now we're like the the world is just kind of going through a crisis, a pandemic, and I have to kind of stop myself sometimes because being on social media and stuff and just watching the news you get worked up and I found myself like in a panic like oh my god like what's going to happen like you know you know like with me just being out of work like am I going to be in the house all day like what if I catch it like so many things have been going through my mind these past weeks and not like I don't know like the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit just been telling me like I don't know. He's kind of giving, and it, and it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of good that I have a lot of free time because it's like he's giving me more opportunity to be with him. But um, what I just been kind of hearing the Holy Spirit say to me is just like, you wanted time. Well, here, here it is. Mm -hmm. Like here it is. You wanted this time. You you said you were too busy. You know you were sleepy after you got off of work here's the free time that I give you, what are you doing with it? You know, and I have to catch myself sometimes because half of the time I'm just sitting in my bed, just laying here, like, I don't know what to do. And then my mind starts to wonder and I get anxious and I get scared. And I'm just like, when I, you know, when I start to pray, it's just like my mind, my mind, like, you know, the Holy Spirit just, he just starts easing my mind, like, okay, Michelle, it's going to be okay, like, you know, don't listen to what the word, because that's what, that's what the enemy wants you to do, he wants you to get worked up, and you know what I'm saying, he wants you to be scared and fearful and have you out here just with no plan or no, you know what I'm saying, so that's just kind of, that's the comment I had on it, you know, in the notes, and what you were just saying, like, wow, like, you know, we have to have the fruits of the Spirit, but we also have to have on our armor, because the the times now are scary it, it it is like you have people are getting affected left and right and you're like well you know am i next you know what i'm saying so it's is 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 very important you know to stay prayed up in times like this that is so good <clears throat> thank you so much for sharing because that's the reality that's the reality and that's where we've been because you do have holy spirit Michelle, you have Holy Spirit and you have him and there's still, you just spoke to mind-binding spirits that try to creep up and speak something different to you. And that's where you then have to overcome the enemy with the mind of Christ and the fruit of the Spirit. And in your time where you are waiting See, now you're in a time where you are waiting. You're in a season of waiting. And while you're waiting on the Lord, and like you said, you may not have a lot to do, but you do things like this. Attend Bible studies virtually. 
like his ministry. Stay in your word, listen to messages, and spend time with the Lord. Spend time with him. Get to know what the fruit of the spirit looks like as it's being yielded in you. You could immediately identify what those mind binding spirits look like of fear, which are strange fruits. But what does it look like then on the opposite end of that totem pole when you know that you are activating your helmet of salvation, your mind of Christ? Then it looks like patience, it looks like peace, right? Instead of fear, it looks like peace, it looks like joy. Why? Because you trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Allow that word to bubble up inside of you. And when you have the mind of Christ, you have Holy Spirit. He will bring all these things flooding back to your mind. When you turn your mind over to him, he might be in your heart. But Mary's, we got to turn our minds and our will and our emotion over to him that we would have the mind of Christ. And this is the time when we need to have that very, very, I mean, we need to do it anyway as children of God, as believers, as conduits of his spirit. In this season, in every season, but just talking to this moment where you are, where we all are, because you're not alone. And thank you so much for your transparency. Thank you so much for sharing that. That we are to stop and we are to breathe and say, Father, I thank you that I have the mind of Christ. I have your spirit and get to understand and know the, the person of Holy Spirit. Get to know him because he will then do what he's been doing. You said he's been talking to you. And he then can help throt all of those fears, all of those concerns. Not that this is not your reality, that this is not our reality. What's taking place in this world today, and it doesn't matter when the next person hears this, this could be years from now. And whatever season they're in, it may not be a global pandemic like we're in right now. But even then, it, what did that, that question say? It said, no matter what mishaps, what no matter what the shortfall or the fallout from everything that's taking place in the future or even now during this global pandemic with this coronavirus and all of these things surrounding it all of the mishaps surrounding it you trust in the lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding and in all your ways acknowledge him as he directs your path. What did that passage of scripture say? It said here that in that Romans 12 and three, for by the grace of God given to me and putting your name there, for by the grace of God given to you, and he says, he says to every one of you, not to think more highly of yourself and of, of your importance and ability. You can't control this. Release, cease from struggling, release control. There's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. But what you can do ultimately is surrender and turn it over to the Lord. You can humble yourself before him. And then you can also think on those things that are of a good report because all of that's in him. It says remaining in his love. What does his love look like? His love is not going to allow those that belong to him to be begging for bread. And guess what else? From a practical standpoint, he's going to give you guidance. He says, but to think so as to have a, have sound judgment as God has apportioned to each a degree of faith. Allow your faith to be activated to another level, to another depth. Take all, this is the opportunity to exercise everything that he has given you, all that he has taught you and have prepared you for such a time as this. 
allow your faith to be activated. Well, again, that's the fruit of the spirit. That's a byproduct of the fruit of the spirit. When you have the mind of Christ, God has a portion to each a degree of faith and purpose designed for his service. Have you assessed what it looks like for everything concerning you to be directed towards his service? And Lord, what is it that you're doing in this season and what is it that you need me to do to please you with my life? And I'm starting right now, even during this season, during this global pandemic. What does that look like? What does it look like to come to the end of myself and not think more highly of myself than I, I, I should or my importance and my ability? Your ability to do what? to make it happen now by wearying or by being afraid or by putting pressure on the Lord and saying, hey, I'm on a timeline. You know I need to go back to work. You know, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to need you to make this happen right now. No, Lord. I cease from struggling. I relinquish control. The spirit of fear is trying to crop up into my heart and in my mind, that mind, body, and spirit, but I turn my mind, my will, and my emotions over to you, Lord, so that I have the mind of Christ is active and engaged, and then the words start to come to me as Holy Spirit is speaking to me through his word, saying, wait for me, wait, be patient, I got you, let me show you which way to go, let me give you guidance, let me give you direction, but while you're waiting, rest in me, rest in my love, trust that I am God, trust that I will never leave you nor forsake you, you are my child, therefore you will not be begging for bread. I'm going to give you what you need and it will never be late and matter of fact when you seek ye first the kingdom of heaven see how that scripture starts coming when you got the mind of christ matthew 6 33 seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all other things will be added to you look at this time in this season as a beautiful time and season because that means when you know that you have been given a portion of faith and that your life belongs to him and you're not your own, you know he's going to do something with this season. And that he also said that he wished that none would perish, but you belong to him. So therefore, he's going to make sure that your needs are met. Do you trust him to do it? Do you trust him to do it? Have you yielded your members to him so that he can show you? Have you taken out time to breathe instead of in a fight or flight mode when you're praying and, and seeking him, but saying, Lord, I just want to fellowship with you because I know that this is an opportunity for you to shine. This is an opportunity for you to do what you do best. Show the world that you are God and you are my God and I dwell in the kingdom. I am seeking your face and not your hand because you already assured me that everything else is going to be added unto me. So I'm going to stop right there because I could keep going because the reality is, is that you're, you're speaking for a lot of folks. You're speaking for all of us, but we have to remind ourselves what set us apart, what set you apart, what set uh, all of us apart. Mary, Michelle, is that we do have Christ Jesus in our lives, but we don't just want him to be in our hearts. And we don't just want to have on the helmet of salvation, securing our fire insurance and it's not engaged. And when we don't have the ability to have the second thought, we don't have the word flooding us. And we're not remaining in his love and we have not come to the end of ourselves, but indeed we want whatever we want so that we can get back to doing what we've been doing. This is a time to assess ourselves, take our inventory and say, okay, God, I repent. And here I am. And when I come to the end of myself, I am then able to stand on behalf of others that are in a fearful state. And they are reaping strange fruit like fear, anxiousness, uncertainty, doubt, worry. 
anxiety and you recognize what that looks like and then you see yourself saying father allow your peace to overtake me and thank you for your grace that gives me the ability to have joy in the midst of this storm and to be able to trust you and know that in you my faith is being activated and taken to a different level in you and when we come out of this thing i won't go back to the way i was but i'm going to stay in tandem and in step with you so that when things are happening and you're speaking i'm not ignoring it but i'm listening because i've yielded my entire members to you that is my mind to you and I trust you to take care of me in this season and out of this season, in this dispensation and out of it. And matter of fact, I heard a man of God say, but the only dispensation that we're in right now is when, when Holy Spirit was said, we're in his dispensation. And he does miracles so great. Do we know that? Or are we bipolar? Because we have him in our heart. So on one hand, we want to call on him, but the other part of our flesh is inflamed. So then we're acting out in fear and we just back and forth. Tossed to and fro. But it's all right, Mary's, because right now we can stop and say, okay, here we are. Here I am. I repent. And I trust you. And I surrender all my members to you, not just a little area of my heart so that I can secure my fire insurance, but my entire life and being to you. And I come to the end of myself, no longer thinking of myself more highly and of my own importance and ability. But I trust you, God. I trust you even when I can't trace you. My helmet of salvation is secure and engaged and active. And every byproduct, byproduct of the fruit of the spirit is engaged right now. I need faith. Come on. Help me, God, to believe. Thank you for your grace to believe. Thank you for the grace to be patient in the midst of this. And I know that no good thing will you withhold from me. So I'm going to study your word so that that word can continue to bubble up on the inside of my heart that's been rendered and yielded to you. I'm not yielding my members to the enemy no more, but him to speak to me about anything. Because I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you got me. Holy Spirit, I thank you. Father God, I give you glory. Because I dwell in the kingdom. All right, I'm stopping right there. Okay, Minister Sarah. Um, I really don't have anything to add to that. I just want to make sure everyone else, if anyone else wanted to be able to make a comment or ask a question, that we give them an opportunity and then we can close it out and wrap up. Anyone else that wanted to ask a question or make a comment, I'm going to unmute you and give you the opportunity. Okay, you're unmuted. If anyone wanted to speak. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. I didn't have a comment either. Well, I didn't have anything to add, but I did want to say that what stuck out to me the most is the being patient about this whole whole entire thing and just knowing that he is in control he ain't, it ain't nobody else but him that can do what he needs to do so that's all well, amen thank you for your comment Anyone else wanted to make a comment or speak? I got the message of having faith in your faith and stepping back and realizing when you're acting out of ego and the spirits that are on you versus you thinking it's your purpose and it can kind of be disguised. So just taking the time and realizing he is in control and like just 
refreshing your own faith and not like doubting your own faith and letting things overcloud it because then everything will just keep growing. That's all. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Evangelist, did you want to add anything else and then go ahead and wrap us up? I just want to say that that is so good because the reality is, is that at the end of the day, we have to lean and depend on the Lord in this season. And we have to know what that looks like for each one of us right where we are. And I love the fact that um, you all are sharing what the spirit of the Lord is downloading to you and take that and take that back to your private devotional time and ask the Lord to expound on that. Everything that he shared, sharing with you and sharing with us individually and collectively, that he teaches us how to walk in tandem with him, how to uh, walk by his spirit, because indeed his spirit, his spirit dwells within us. And if in this moment, we may feel that we need to hit reset and we're not where we need to be because we have been somehow allowing this global pandemic to illuminate everything, every fear, every concern, every mind-binding spirit of doubt and uh, not having the faith that we desire to have. And even uh, Mary, as one of you, Mary spoke to said, um, discovering in this season, you know, what's truly my destiny and what that looks like and the difference. And not allowing, I want to add to that, to the enemy to speak to us and deceive us. But what's the truth? And that truth is in his word and the truth is in uh, having the mind of Christ so that we can even understand what it is that he's making reference to when he speaks to the truth because the enemy is a liar and he is a counterfeit. So you're right. He will try to deceive us and tell us something different. Contrary to what the word really says and contrary to what his will really is. And he will try to mask that thing with fear and put all types of things in our head and speak to us and tell us something different that what could possibly happen from a world's standpoint or from the enemy's standpoint of defeat and fear and destruction and demise. And in that place, we have to say, okay, Father, I yield my members to you. That's my mind, my will, and my emotions, everything in me, not just my heart, that little area in my heart that loves you, but everything, I turn it over to you so that I can understand what you're doing in this season. And then even if I don't fully understand it, I'm going to trust you even when I can't trace you. Because one thing about the world, the world will tell you, let me show you, show me, show me, show me, then I'll trust you and I'll believe you. So instead of us saying, you know, let me wait until I see what they're going to do. They're talking about these bailouts. They're talking about what they're gonna do to try to fix the situation before I actually believe it. But the Lord says, believe me and then I'll show you. So no matter what's going on, Know the signature of God. Know the difference. And if you have the mind of Christ, you have Holy Spirit. That's why I would say study the acts of the apostles. Study the word of God. Study, you know, what Holy Spirit does, how he moves, the person of Holy Spirit, so that you know exactly who's speaking. Whether it's the enemy, because he's the author of confusion and fear. He has his own language and how he communicates to our minds. And then the spirit of the Lord. Because remember, we talked about an, uh, uh, the strange fruit that comes from the enemy and how he then communicates to us through his own language of lies and confusions. He has his own language. And then the spirit of the Lord, truth. Even though you don't understand it, but when you have the mind of Christ and say, Father, 
activate my helmet of salvation that is engaged in you and is yielded to the Holy Spirit so that I will know the truth and the truth will set me free. Free from confusion, free from fear, free from every other thing that the enemy would try to speak to me in this season through people, through social media, through even friends and family. But that I will be steadfast and unmovable in you and I know the truth and the truth dwells within you and I will remain in your love. And your love says that it will not allow me to beg for bread. Your love says that because I belong to you and I've yielded my members to you and myself to you, that Jeremiah 29 and 11 which says, I know the plans that I have for you. My plans are to prosper you. Listen to this, not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future and a good outcome. He didn't say that when the pandemic comes or any other situation that will come down the road, that that's not applicable to your life. That Jeremiah 29 and 11, his word is always active and alive in your life. It is. That is your portion. But do you even have the mind of Christ to believe it and to be able to rest in it? So study, study the word. Study your word and study Holy Spirit and what it looks like to have Holy Spirit in your life. And I would start with that Galatians 5, uh, 22. Actually, matter of fact, go back up to Galatians 5. Start with 19. Because you want to know what the, the differences are so you can do a comparison and a contrast between what the acts of the flesh look like, the world's way, and what God's way is, the God of heaven, his way. What that looks like to be resting in him and then what it looks like to be in, in a panic and chaos and all those other things that the world speaks to. So study the word, study Holy Spirit. And invite him in again into your whole being, not just your heart. And, out, and we're speaking to uh, those of you mares that might say, okay, I need to do a reset then. I need to do a heart reset. Though I have Holy Spirit in my heart and he's there to secure my fire insurance for eternal life. But I really want to yield my entire members to you, my mind, my will, and my emotions to you. And I want to do that now by rededicating my life to you. So we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. And for any other individual that will receive this Bible study, at some point on your journey, it may come through your news feeds and you don't know Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins. So you don't know anything except what it looks like to be in confusion and fear and, and, and not knowing what's going to happen next and waiting for the world to act and make it better and wanting it to happen now, now, now. And you want to operate and you want to dwell in the love of God. You want to, to, to be cloaked and hidden in him. And you want the mind of Christ, which would be the byproducts of the fruit of the spirit, of that love and that joy and that peace and that goodness and that gentleness, that meekness, that long suffering and faithfulness, the, the ability to have faith that God is going to do it and the grace to be able to carry that out and the rest if I missed one. So let's pray a prayer of salvation, giving us the opportunity right now to reset. Just to have a reset. And for those that will hear this that don't know Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sins and you want to know him and you want to become a, not just a fan of God, not just a fan of Jesus Christ, a fan of Holy Spirit, God. Not just a fan of the Trinity. You want to be a follower. You don't want to be on the outside looking in and saying, well, I believe it. You know, I mess with him like that, but I mess with him from the outside. No, I am committed to him. I'm all in. I'm all in. And I turn my entire life, my entire being over to him. And even when I can't trace him in the midst of this pandemic, I'm going to trust him because I am a kingdom citizen. 
I seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all other things will be added unto me. Every provision will be met for me. Jeremiah 29 and 11 is active in my life. Therefore, my whole destiny is already set for me, and it is a good outcome, and I will prosper, and I will prosper even as my soul prospers in Christ Jesus. So I turn my life over to you, and I want that relationship with you. I want to be able to wait and have patience and look to you and not look to the world for my answers and for my help, and that I can trust that my help comes from a true and living God and I'm committed to him and I'm committed to his purposes, his plans and I turn my life over and I won't perish. I won't. And he's going to provide for me even now in this season, in this global pandemic, doesn't matter that everybody else is running hell to skelter. I am going to be steadfast and unmovable in you. And Lord, I repent, forgive me for acting otherwise. And I'm going to rededicate my life to you now. And I won't mix the world with your truth. And I won't start over here trying to hear what they got to say on this side from other uh, gods and deities of new age and this and that and, and you know, uh, that type of mind control. But I surrender all to you, the true and living God, and I will no longer allow the world to be infiltrated in my life and to take up any type of residency within my character but not just my heart am i giving to you or rededicating to you give my whole life to you right now i'm going to do it now and i'm going to pray this prayer i'm gonna pray this prayer romans 10 8 3 11 i'm gonna read the scripture then we're gonna pray the prayer and then you pray this prayer in a stance of surrender and this will be the beginning of your reset, or this will be the beginning of the beginning for you. And what he has for you and his plans for you. And it is indeed to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you hope and a good future and a good outcome. Yes, even the, in the midst of a global pandemic. Absolutely, yes. Okay, Romans 10, 8 through 11, and it reads, the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning the faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him, who is him, that's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, will never be put to shame. So pray this prayer in a stance of surrender. This is a decision that you are making to reset or to receive Jesus Christ into your heart. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before your throne of grace in a stance of surrender with a repentant heart. I confess my sins and I ask earnestly that you would forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. By confessing my sins and asking for forgiveness in areas where I have doubted you, where I have been fearful, or where I have not trusted you, or where I have been mixing and mingling with the world, I ask for forgiveness right now. Where I allowed my flesh and my own self-will, my self-conceit, and my own plans to get in the way, I ask for forgiveness right now. So by confessing my sins and asking for forgiveness, Lord, I thank you that that clears all legal ground that the enemy had against me. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you died on the cross of Calvary and that on the third day you were raised from the dead. I believe that you transcended into heaven and now sitting at the right hand of God, 
making intercession for me. I believe that your blood paid for my sins, giving me the free gift of salvation and eternal life. I accept that free gift. And I ask Holy Spirit that you would come into my heart and that you would take up residency within me. Fill me with your love, with your truth, with your light and with revelation. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did on the cross of Calvary, for the benefits that were imputed to me and that are imputed to me because of what you did on the cross of Calvary, granting me full access to the kingdom of God. Now I as well am seated in heavenly places with you, Father God, for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Mary, so now if you have rededicated your life to Christ, this is where you begin. You have a clean slate. You have a recalibrated heart and mind. You do not have to dwell with a wrong mindset in that wilderness mentality, whatever that looks like for you. But now you can say, okay, Father, I have surrendered all to you. And if you have received Jesus Christ for the first time, now take up your marching orders. And, you know, uh, right now, uh, there are so many different ministries and churches that are online and they're ministering. Continue to uh, study your word and listen to the word. Individuals that are preaching Jesus Christ, the Son of God and God of heaven, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Holy Spirit, knowing that they are speaking to look and see what they believe. Go on their websites and their pages. If you're not able to go to a physical church right now, see what they believe, that they believe in the unadulterated word of God, that they believe in God, the Father, God of heaven, and they believe that Jesus Christ is his son and that he died on the cross and that Holy Spirit then is a part of the Trinity who is with us now helping us to navigate the terrains in this journey. Study your word and pray. What is prayer? Simply your communication with the Lord and telling him everything and he will then continue to and will begin to speak to you. And you know what that looks like tonight because if you prayed that prayer, he was tugging on your heart and that's what it feels like. So as simple as that, you rededicated your life and have a fresh, clean uh, start. And now we're just going to go ahead and pray out all right, just to close out tonight's Bible study. And this is just going to be a prayer for, um, for our minds, for cleansing our minds and for clarity. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. As we close out tonight's Bible study, we thank you that we don't close out our dialogue with you. We incline our ears to hear you, our eyes to see you, our lips to speak you, and our feet to go in any direction that you call us to. Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus we ask you to wash our minds with the blood of Jesus and cleanse out all darkness and all thoughts that are contrary to your will and your destiny for our lives. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to shut any doors that need to be shut, whether spiritual or natural, and to open any doors that need to be opened, whether spiritual or natural, in our lives. Heavenly Father, we ask you to give us clarity of vision, clarity of sight, clarity of thought, clarity of mind, clarity of knowing and hearing your voice. And a stranger we will not follow. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, and amen. Glory to God. Amen. All right, Marys. Okay, we're going to go ahead and we're closing out tonight. I don't know, Minister Sarah, do you have anything? All right, Marys, we love you. We love you back. 
Uh, thank you for granting us audience tonight. Invite someone else out um, on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for his ministry, Hearts and Submission, where we sit at the feet of Jesus. We will see you on next Tuesday. Have an amazing evening.